going to give you a quick overview of who Sunset Learning is, and then we'll jump right into our SD-WAN overview. First of all, why are we doing this, and who in the world is Sunset Learning? Sunset Learning is a technology training company, for those of you who are not aware. And we've been around for uh, about 20 years, a little over 20 years, doing Cisco training. We really got our start in 1992 as a Novell authorized training partner. And from there, we uh, partnered with a number of industry-leading vendors to deliver their training curriculum, as well as uh, developing and delivering our own brand of custom curriculum. We just like to make sure that everybody is aware of what's going on in the market. And although SD-WAN is not necessarily a brand new technology, it certainly is at the tip of everybody's tongues these days. So it's something we thought would be useful for folks to uh, talk about or at least have an overview of. What I'm very excited about is we have our new Emerging Technologies Division, where we'll be doing a lot more of these webinars on some of the newer technologies that are out there, like big data analytics, whatever the new software-defined X is, blockchain, artificial intelligence, maybe some machine learning, maybe Python with Zeppelin, and other things that we'll talk about maybe later this year. If you contact us and let us know you want to hear about something, we'll try to put something together as well. And I thought maybe I'd just share with you uh, some things that make us a little bit unique. When you go to a lot of training uh, events, one of the things that happens is you go to that event, you get a little bit of training, and then it happens to be over uh, at the end of that day, week, month, whatever it happens to be. At Sunset Learning, we have a new philosophy that we call our 365 days of learning, where you may go to one of our events, one of our training events, but you have access to content in that particular subject matter area over the course of an entire year versus just that, uh, that short period of time that you might be in the classroom. And, and one of the things that we also know that happens to be frustrating to um, the customers that we've had over the years is you sign up for a training class and then the training organization cancels that class because, due to low enrollment or other issues. With our schedule, we're 100% guaranteed to run, so anything that you see on our schedule, you can be assured we're going to run that class as long as we have at least one student enrolled. And we, we offer very flexible ways for students to attend training. For instance, you can attend training like you are today from the comfort of, of your own home. Uh, you can come to one of our facilities and sit through training. And when you come to that facility, you can elect to either sit with the instructor at one of our uh, Sunset Learning facilities, or you can receive that training through a high-definition telepresence unit at one of our uh, over 50 locations throughout the United States. And then finally, uh, a lot of our customers uh, will opt for a customized private training type of an arrangement where Everything that's off the shelf from these different vendors may not necessarily be applicable to them, but they want to pick different pieces and parts that meet the needs of their organization for training. And that's really what falls into the bucket of customized training. And we'll also do those in a private format if that makes sense. For instance, some organizations don't necessarily want to share what they're doing. We'll do that on site and we'll do it private for them so they don't have to worry about that. So anyway, that's a little about who Sunset Learning is. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our regularly scheduled program here. And if you have any questions at the end, I'll have some contact information so you can get a hold of us. So in this session, what I wanted to talk to you about or provide for you was just a bit of an overview of uh, the uh, software-defined WAN technologies and the challenges it was developed to solve. We'll look at some common solution components examine a few vendor-centric implementation approaches, and talk about some of the things that you should probably think about if you're considering an SD-WAN solution. Uh, you know, what is SD-WAN, and really, why do we care? Uh, you know, why is it such a hot topic this year? You know, we have industry analysts out there telling us in the next couple of years, uh, the SD-WAN market is going to grow to over $8 billion. In some cases, that's huge for what seems to be a technology that's only been hyped really in the last uh, couple of years. But um, the technologies itself and the things that are going on with it have been around for a little while, and uh, folks are really jumping into the pool. And really, when we talk about SD-WAN, we're really describing a new architectural approach that will modernize our remote office connectivity. And really, the reason for that is we, we need better uh, application performance across the network. We want to improve our organizational agility to market changes and demands. We, we'd like to reduce the downtime if we can. We want to lower our costs. And at the same time, we have to always take security into consideration. And probably the final and biggest piece that 
gets down to the, the cost savings as well, is we want to be able to simplify overall management of these branch offices. You know, it's probably not such a big deal when you think about one or two branch offices, but when you're talking about hundreds or thousands of branch offices, uh, simplification is always a benefit. So an interesting thing, when we start talking about drivers for uh, SD-WAN, you know, one of the things that's happened is we've streamlined our business processes by relying on cloud-based productivity applications such as Salesforce, maybe Office 365 or Skype for Business, or even video applications like WebEx or uh, Citrix GoToMeeting or some of these things. And that's great. We had great intentions of throwing those things into place and allowing our users at the branch office to access those resources. But traditionally, a lot of organizations, especially larger organizations, have been backhauling that traffic through their wide area links and to their data centers or their uh, enterprise headquarters and relying on big internet connections at those centralized locations. And the problem with that is those connections down to the branch offices tend to be a little bit smaller and that uh, backhauling that traffic through our corporate networks really has nullified our efforts to improve performance in some of these things that we're talking about here because they just can't handle this new, more modern type of load that we're putting on them. So what are our options? You know, one of the things we could do is we could certainly add bandwidth to our, uh, to our dedicated WAN circuits that we have down there, but that tends to be expensive and it also takes weeks or even months to execute on. And imagine doing that across, again, a thousand branch offices. It takes a lot of time and planning. The other alternative, which a lot of organizations have already done, is they've added inexpensive broadband uh, circuits to their branch offices that connect them directly to the internet. Now, potentially that, or that link uh, to the internet offloads a lot of that traffic, that's, uh, that's a positive, and it can also be configured in such a manner that it can provide a backup which uh, addresses this reduced downtime uh, component that we have here. But there's a little bit of complexity there in that we, in, in the past, when we only had a single connection or just a few connections through our data centers and our headquarters to the internet, now we could have hundreds or thousands of connections directly to the internet, and all of a sudden we have a lot of security concerns about how are we going to make sure that we configure each and every one of those locations uh, in a secure manner, and don't make any mistakes. So there's positives and negatives to being able to do that, and certainly there's been technology around for a long time that enables us to balance the load between the, those links, maybe the private uh, wide area network link, and maybe we use the, uh, the internet link as a backup. We can do a little bit of load balancing, but it takes a lot of configuration effort and, again, complexity to do that. So for one or two branch offices, not a big deal. For uh, hundreds or thousands of branch offices, that gets to be a pretty big headache for the IT organization. Really, that's what SD-WAN is all about. SD-WAN technologies enable us to make the most efficient use of these different network connections that we may have out there at the branch office simultaneously and securely. So as we go through this presentation, we'll take a little bit deeper look at that. Now I've lifted this graphic and um, paraphrased something that uh, the XDX Central uh, group uh, posted out here. And if anybody's uh, familiar with SDX Central, they post a lot of information, uh, really good information about uh, software-defined networking, uh, software-defined WAN, software-defined everything. And so it's just a very good repository of shared information that's out there. And uh, so keep this graphic in mind. Uh, the graphic I put up here because uh, I just wanted you to have an illustration of what we're talking about here, that MPLS connection being uh, the traditional private wide area network connection that you might have in place. You know, 20 years ago we called it something else, but MPLS is the technology that has taken us uh, to this point forward. And then a lot of those branch offices, like we talked about, might have a uh, direct internet connection. So we'll have maybe one, and really when we talk about software defined WAN, although uh, some of the technologies can work with a single connection, really the benefits of software defined WAN is the idea that uh, you can have multiple connections connecting your branch office or remote offices to your data centers or to your headquarters, and it's going to enable us to make the best and most efficient use of all of those links that we happen to have in place. That's really what this is about. I love it when uh, organizations use acronyms to define other acronyms, but there you go. SD-WAN is a specific application of SDN, 
applied to WAN connections. What I thought maybe we should step back and talk about a little bit is what we mean by software defined. It's kind of like the term cloud from a few years ago. You know, I asked 10 people what cloud meant, and you get 10 different uh, ideas of what it might be. And the same seems to happen today with software defined. It's the latest marketing buzzword that's being applied to really make uh, the latest or even not so latest technology sound cool. But for the purposes of this conversation, we need to tighten it up a little bit. So at a high level, there's really two components that affect how our networking equipment, such as routers and switches, uh, security devices like firewalls, uh, VPN concentrators, et cetera, do their job. And really the first component is a software that makes all those decisions about how to treat the traffic, how it should be handled, how it should be forwarded through the device. And really the second component is how do we handle the physical connections, how do we make those? And then those, uh, those devices actually do the actual forwarding of the traffic onto the network. When you take those uh, two pieces and you look at them, just remember that in pre-software defined architectures, both of those functions exist together within each networking device that we have on the network. And everything has worked really well uh, with respect to that, but there's complexity in it because if every device has its own intelligence built in and then it has its own forwarding functionality and that type of thing, it means, uh, number one, that we have to manage each and every one of those devices independently which can add cost and overhead just to the manageability and configuration, deployment, et cetera, of those devices. And secondly, because we have to support this big software stack and operating system, et cetera, within each one of those devices uh, so that it can operate autonomously, we have to duplicate a lot of hardware like CPUs and memory and storage. That tends to make those devices expensive. If we could actually take and pull that common software component that provides all of that that uh, intelligence out of that device and move it to a centralized location on a network, then we're left with a relatively unintelligent device that can sit down and just provide those different network connections for us. And that is really the basis of what software, uh, the software defined buzzword that we're talking about today in this conversation is all about. We take and we separate and centralize the software control function from the traffic forwarding function. And if you're at a party with a bunch of networking propeller heads, you'll really hear about this as a separation of the control plane from the data plane. If you don't find yourself in those types of parties, then you don't have to worry about that terminology. With that software now centralized, we have the potential of having visibility into how application network requirements work, the usage patterns that we have, device capability, security controls, and other variables that impact the overall network performance. Uh, we can also gather information about end-to-end -end network performance from our devices. And with that information, we can automate the configuration of those devices, maybe changing uh, how they're operating dynamically based on information collected from the network applications and policies that we have. So, for instance, in this diagram where we have a couple of uh, connections to the network, what this visibility gives us the opportunity to optimize how we send the traffic over both of those links using them uh, in an equally shared fashion or maybe non-symmetric fashion, depending on how much bandwidth happens to be available at any point in time. Or if we have mission critical applications, we can push them along one link and we can push our other traffic, maybe that uh, those folks that are browsing Facebook or whatever, down another link that's not so important. So uh, while we could, do, again, do that in the past, Typically, we had to have static policies set up, and if we made any changes to those policies, we'd have to manually go down and actually do that on a per-device basis. In the SD-WAN world, what we're doing is we're going to go to that centralized application, and we're going to deploy our policies in that application, and it's going to watch the network and see what's going on and watch those applications and how they're performing and dynamically adjust how uh, that uh, traffic is steered over the network. What about that WAN part? Well, we've established that, uh, you know, from the software perspective, we've moved that and we understand what software defined is now. And we've established that our goal is to have at least one network connection, but ideally more from our remote offices so that we can use those uh, different circuits to uh, direct the traffic in a more efficient manner. Anytime you're, those circuits are being provided by one of our traditional service providers, we're just going to call that a WAN connection. 
if it's some sort of uh, broadband wireless connection, et cetera, that we happen to have, maybe an LTE connection that provides us access to the internet similar to what we have at home, we'll just call that an internet connection. And the only reason I'm saying that is in a lot of the documentation that you read from these different vendors that are out here providing SD-WAN solutions, is they're going to refer to WAN connections and they're going to refer to internet connections, and you're going to go, oh, man, I use them both. Uh, just make sure you know where their terminology is coming from. No matter what connections you have, uh, let's just assume that you have more than one type, as in this diagram, connecting to your remote locations. The SD-WAN software itself is going to make those connections appear as one to uh, one interface to the applications and to the users on the network. As users, we don't care how the information gets moved around as long as it happens reliably, quickly, and hopefully securely. And just maybe as a side note, when we fool other applications and people into thinking something is one thing when it's really something else, we'll just call that abstraction. And you'll care about that a little bit because when you read, again, the literature from these techie companies providing this stuff, they're going to say, hey, SD-WAN abstracts the network connections. Well, now you know what they're talking about. It just makes those multiple connections look as one logical connection out there. And once we abstract those connections, then we can optimize the performance over those links again. So that's simple, at least in concept. But the, the problem is now there's over 40 different vendors competing in the SD-WAN space, and probably more being added every day. Because remember, everybody wants a piece of that $8 billion pie that's uh, looming out there in the next couple of years. So what we really should do is examine some of the key characteristics of software-defined wide area networking so that you can differentiate between the different approaches that are out there. Some of those solutions should minimally include support for multiple WAN and internet connections, such as MPLS, of course, LTE, fiber, DSL, cable, etc. They should, of course, have a simple-to-use centralized user interface for the configuration, management, reporting of uh, the SD-WAN software that we have out there. They should be policy-driven, right? We should be able to take our business policies and what we want to accomplish uh, business-wise and be able to deploy those easily through uh, the uh, these software user interface. And these, uh, the software should be able to provide dynamic path selection. If one of my links, maybe my internet link is becoming congested, or maybe my wide area network link is being congested, becoming congested because all of a sudden I have a bunch of video traffic or something occurring, the software should be able to steer that traffic over those links dynamically. Maybe one of my links goes down. The other link should be able to, uh, the software should tell the other link to pick up all of the traffic in that particular case. So we get optimal application performance and resiliency when we're uh, policy based. The ability to secure traffic uh, is paramount. It's a good idea to understand how that traffic is going to be secured over the network. A lot of SD WAN vendors now uh, have offered the opportunity to deploy network functionality such as firewalls and wide area network uh, performance accelerators, uh, web gateways, et cetera, in software or virtualized software to the customer's uh, branch office. And we'll talk a little bit about how they managed to do that. But instead of having to have dedicated appliances out there to do each one of these network functions, we may deliver that service now uh, or deliver that functionality as a service in software. That does bring me to another buzzword that I, uh, that's starting to emerge now. It seems to be a subset of SD-WAN that we're now calling SD-Branch. And what that really means is one of the goals of uh, SD-WAN is simplification. And if the goal is simplification, one of the things we care about, and we've cared about it for years, uh, is how do we take those multiple networking devices that we might have at the branch office and consolidate them into a smaller number of devices that we have to manage. We are, if we're discreetly managing a firewall and a wide area acceleration appliance and, and maybe some other things, uh, it gets to be very complicated and, again, more costly to manage the network. So uh, these are just some things to think about as we do that. And the idea of taking all of that functionality and slamming it into maybe one generic server device through virtualized software is this concept called SD branch. Okay. So don't get thrown off too much by that. You might start hearing these things used interchangeably as the vendors go forward. And now finally, maybe one of the most important uh, pieces here is one of the things we haven't had 
except maybe if we bought extra pieces of software, is visibility of application traffic usage. Uh, and the ability to perform analytics on that traffic to drive dynamic network changes. So one of the things we're going to want to do is uh, we want our SD-WAN solutions to provide that visibility so we can refine our policies and understand exactly what's going on with our network. Okay, yeah, as now, some other uh, common components that you might find in an SD-WAN offer might be an appliance or a device, whether it's a generic Intel-based server or x86 type server, or a, a dedicated piece of hardware with a bunch of interfaces on it to take these WAN connections into it. You'll find one of those uh, typically in these different implementations. Another thing that you might hear about are uh, the software as a service gateways for accessing cloud-based applications, uh, such as the ones we talked about, Office 365, Salesforce, et cetera. And we'll talk a little bit about why those are necessary as we look at some of these different approaches. From an approach perspective, how do different vendors and service providers provide SD-WAN services is really what I'm getting at here. And there's no real industry-defined terminology for these approaches just yet. So I'm just going to call one of them the SD-WAN overlay approach and one the SD-WAN network. And uh, these other things are not really approaches although they're worth considering, and we'll talk about them maybe in the next section. In the SD-WAN overlay approach, what happens is the vendor is going to create a virtual overlay WAN by positioning an appliance either in front of or behind or maybe, maybe in place of your existing premise routers. And uh, you remember the routers, that piece that's going to actually get you connected to the wide area network. These appliances will typically accept all of the different connections from your uh, wide area network providers or your internet providers. And again, that is the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the jobs of that device then is to abstract those uh, network interfaces from the applications and from the users on the network. You don't care. It's just to you, it's a big pipe that goes out there and gets your traffic to where it needs to go. But to the, um, to the different vendors, it's a very important piece of equipment because it gives them an aggregation point for those network connections, and it's where their software runs uh, that talks to that centralized component that actually um, is able to react to moving the traffic, or what uh, is commonly referred to as steering the traffic in one direction or another. I don't know why they use the word steering these days when they talk about SD-WAN technologies. In the old days, we just called it routing. But there you go. That's what the overlay really does. And the thing about these overlays is it creates this virtual SD-WAN network that you have out there. Your traffic goes into that network. And then it may, not, it may or may not have a way to escape that network before it gets to uh, another endpoint. And that, uh, that escape path, you may want it to be one of those uh, things like going to Salesforce.com or going to Office 365. And if you want to get that traffic off of the network, uh, you'll have to have some uh, gateways, uh, which are commonly referred to as your software as a service gateways, or other gateways that uh, get you out to other locations on the network. Those appliances can either be thick appliances or thin appliances. And that the thick or thin just means the amount of functionality that may be, be built into them. For example, you may have uh, a thick device that does this link aggregation for you, but it may also have additional, what we'll call a virtual network functionality built into it, which might include a firewall or a network optimizer or other security components. So depending again on the vendor and the vendor's approach, they may do that. On the other hand, it may be a very thin appliance. We may be pro providing all of that uh, virtual network functionality somewhere in the cloud and uh, delivering very a few of those services all the way down to the premise equipment. So it, it depends on how that's being provided. And really that takes us to this discussion about the, uh, the network approach. When we look at that, we're talking about uh, delivering uh, wide area network services to the customer, typically from a service provider, where the service provider provisions all of their SD-WAN services in the cloud and then delivers those uh, services down through our traditional routers that we have out there. Now, that limits a lot of the flexibility that they may have uh, and the customer may have for using multiple different uh, network providers. Whereas if we're in an overlay uh, situation, typically we're, we're very agnostic as far as 
where we're getting our network services from, both wide area and internet services. If I'm delivering stuff and my, uh, uh, my SD-WAN demarcation point is up in the cloud, I have less flexibility about what internet providers and service providers I can use. I may be locked into just one. So sometimes what you'll see is, a, this, again, a thin appliance being deployed on-premise by a service provider where they manage that device, but it provides that aggregation uh, facility for you. I was going through this effort of putting this, uh, this conversation together for you, and I thought, well, let me look out there and see if, um, with all of these 40, uh, maybe more different vendors out there, if anybody's uh, sort of taken a stab at categorizing different vendors, one of the things I found was a document by Gartner uh, that they put together last year where they took about the top 25 uh, SD-WAN vendors and they categorized these vendors into different groups, which they called protectors, revolutionary disruptors, and evolutionary disruptors. They give a little bit of a, a marketing blurb about each one of these vendors and their approaches uh, to how they're providing SD-WAN services. And also, a little bit of their motivation. Uh, we know their motivation is to always make money, but how they actually bring their, uh, their offers to market is really based on what their perspective uh, has been. And Cisco is kind of an outlier out there because they're always kind of uh, leading edge uh, with what they're thinking. In fact, I think Cisco was thinking about um, SD-WAN before it was called SD-WAN, where uh, Cisco had an approach called IWAN. And IWAN was really, hey, how do we take a lot of the functionality we already have built into our router and remarket that in such a way that we can say, hey, a lot of people are showing interest in using uh, lower cost internet connections as their wide area network versus paying for these very uh, expensive MPLS circuits. So that was uh, Cisco's IWAN is internet is WAN. But let's get back to this, uh, these categories, protectors. Typically, if your business is selling network hardware, for instance, Cisco, Juniper, Huawei, happen to be leaders in that space, right, of providing uh, wide area connection hardware, both at the data center side as well as the branch office side. What you want to do, even as these emerging technologies come up, is you want to protect your core business. And really, when we look at it, uh, these industry analysts are saying, hey, within the next couple of years, you know, 40 to 50 percent of those traditional WAN edge devices could be displaced by lower cost wide area network connectivity appliances from these SD WAN providers. Well, that's a big threat. And uh, these organizations really have to consider what strategic moves they're going to use to protect their business. Now, I thought Cisco was a good example here uh, because we, they started out, of course, uh, understanding that this was a probability going forward, especially with the low cost of internet connectivity. And so they introduced IWAN as a, as a kind of a marketing umbrella. And later on, they, uh, they acquired Meraki, who gave them a very solid managed service uh, type of capability for uh, remote office connectivity. And that was interesting, but it wasn't quite SD-WAN. But not, nonetheless, it got folded on, in under the uh, IWAN umbrella. But last year, Cisco uh, did something very interesting in, in acquiring uh, a company called v Viptela. And Viptela was a pure play, what we call a revolutionary disruptor in the SD-WAN space. Another one, in other words, this is one of those companies that these protectors uh, of uh, these traditional WAN services and appliances should be afraid of because they were going to come in with a uh, inexpensive uh, device that ran fairly generic software uh, that could actually uh, displace these very expensive uh, branch routers that we have out there in place. And they were going to do it in a new way. They were going to do it in a software-defined model where you can centralize all of the management uh, and uh, intelligence in the cloud and then uh, drop a low-cost appliance at the branch office that would provide that aggregation of the wide area network links and the internet links. And you could steer then the traffic uh, in a very efficient manner over the network. And uh, these devices would also support things like uh, virtualized network function. When we look at that space, we have Viptelo, we have VeloCloud, we have Versa, we have a number of these different companies who jumped in and said, hey, let's forget about the traditional. Let's just attack this market and go after these. And that's what really the revolutionary disruptors are. They're not trying to protect uh, their installed base because they didn't have one. They're trying to uh, really displace uh, what's already out there with a more modern solution. The fact that Cisco went from protecting their base to actually acquiring a company that <laughs> was doing this was interesting because, of course, now they're on the leading edge of uh, SD-WAN with the, uh, the tele solution out there as well. Finally, we have the evolutionary disruptors. These guys are uh, 
folks that uh, said, okay, we're not market share leaders in the wide area networking appliances. We'll leave that to those guys like Cisco, Juniper, Huawei, et cetera. But we think we can add significant value in uh, providing wide area network optimizers. We can provide things like uh, dedicated security appliances. And so that's what these folks did traditionally. But again, seeing some opportunity in some adjacent technologies in, in uh, the SD-WAN area is a way that they are moving forward in the SD-WAN space. So they're taking what they're really good at, uh, let's say uh, wide area optimization, which uh, Silver Peak is an example of providing that service, and adding that to SD-WAN services and an appliance, well, that, um, that gives them a little differentiation over somebody like Big Leaf Networks who Big Leaf says, hey, we're going to go ahead and create a fully functional uh, SD-WAN solution using uh, the internet as a transport. We're not going to worry about MPLS and all that other stuff. We'll just go ahead and use the internet. Now, that's cool, and they provide quality of service uh, types of functionality to uh, take advantage of multiple internet links and try to balance the traffic over there and optimize the traffic and get it to its de destination um, in a best effort fashion which might be a little bit better than just having uh, a plain internet connection, but they're not going to offer any service level guarantees or wide area network optimization. Whereas Silver Peak, because that was their business beforehand, is certainly going to try to optimize that traffic. This, these are some of the things uh, that you need to kind of look at if you're considering an SD-WAN uh, type of a uh, selection process. Is, you know, who, who do I trust? Who do I want to go with? What, uh, what philosophy works the best for us in going in here? Do we just rip off the Band-Aid and go with one of these revolutionary guys? Or uh, do we have a big investment maybe in some of this other stuff and we want to uh, keep leveraging that going forward, at least in the short term? Those are really the vendor perspectives. But, and I talked a little bit about this. There are some considerations then. The one thing is, of course, if you read any of the literature from any of these um, SD-WAN providers, uh, they all sound awesome, and everybody solves uh, the problems that we want. We want better agility, we want lower cost, uh, we want better performance. But you really have to dig into that, you know, and you have to think a little bit about not only what the vendor is providing and what they're guaranteeing or not guaranteeing, but also you, you want to think about who's going to uh, deploy this solution. Am I going to do it myself, or am I going to outsource this to a service provider? And, you know, when you're having that uh, internal discussion, one of the things to think about is, you know, do I have the knowledge and skills on staff today to be able to do this? And do I have time to skill up in that area if I have to? And this, this whole discussion about virtualizing our wide area network connections and centralizing the configuration of that can be scary to network engineers. So we're like, well, if you, you know, that was my job. My job was to manage the wide area network. And I made my living configuring all of those thousands of devices that we have out there. Uh, this is a new paradigm for those folks. And, and they're going to have to skill up or learn something different or do something different. And, and really, maybe that wasn't the most valuable use of their time. Maybe you want them working on more innovative projects anyway. So uh, it's just something to think about as you go through here is who's going to deploy it. Uh, and uh, how, how do I want to leverage those resources? Another question is, you know, does that solution support multiple network providers at the remote location? Again, this gets to uh, that sort of vendor approach. Am I going to have a service provider delivering all my services from the cloud because that's really cool? I won't have any on-prem equipment at all uh, or very minimal on-prem equipment. Uh, or um, do I want a little bit uh, richer feature set down at the branch? Do I want it to be able to run autonomously even when that wide area ne network connection is not there? And uh, will I have that aggregation point to give me the flexibility of having multiple network providers if I need it? So those are some things to think about there. Uh, we just talked about this. What, if any, service level guarantees are provided uh, with the solution? Well, if we're using internet-only transport, as good as uh, algorithms can be to do error correction and provide uh, uh, quality of service and look at those metrics on the network and steer traffic over uh, another connection. Remember, we're still using the internet as a transport uh, in, in some cases, and it's really hard to make uh, a full service level guarantee. So if you have some applications that are uh, considered 100% mission critical and they have to be low latency, 
you'll probably want to hang on to um, your MPLS connection and maybe have uh, internet connections or uh, connection or connections as um, other ways to offload that traffic and keep your mission critical stuff on the MPLS connection. That's what we call, uh, by the way, in this uh, terminology, a hybrid WAN. The uh, the mixture of not all, uh, the mixture of really wide area network and internet technologies together. Uh, does the solution provide wide area optimization? Well, certainly, you know, one of the things about wide area accelerators or wide area optimizers is their ability to compress the the, the data and send it over the network so it effectively appears like you have more bandwidth when really it's compressing the data and decompressing it on the other side. And that's cool. Uh, wide area optimization is great, but you want to make sure that if you've already made an invest in, in, investment in wide area optimization, that you've also um, uh, talked to your uh, SD-WAN vendor or vendors about whether it's compatible with their solution, because they may or may not have their own solution. Well, you, you certainly want to understand what scheme is going to be used to protect the data from end to end, or if there's any gaps in there uh, as far as that goes. We already talked about the fact that you want to be able to hop off that uh, that virtual network uh, maybe to the uh, software as a service cloud. Fascinatingly, uh, you would think that that would be something that's built into every offer, but it's not. Some of uh, the SD-WAN vendors out there focus on getting your traffic from end to end, but they don't have a provision in there for getting your traffic out to uh, one of these software as a service providers. So you certainly want to ask that question. Another interesting one is, do the new uh, you know do these appliances that they're going to put in place have a way to terminate legacy WAN circuits. The vast majority of appliances that I've looked at don't have traditional wide area networking connections. They don't have a T1 or a serial interface uh, where a lot of the older SD or the older wide area network connections were made. So uh, you may have to put this device behind your router because that router is actually out there providing those legacy uh, wide area network connections. So it's just something to, uh, uh, to make sure that you're aware of as you go down there because uh, as you, if you're in your calculations and you're saying, hey, it's going to save me all kinds of money to deploy these new uh, lightweight uh, SD-WAN appliances, and then you have to stick that behind a router, remember that that router still has to be configured independently of the SD-WAN solution because it's not part of that mix. And maybe uh, some things I don't have on here are some deployment recommendations. And we see a lot of interest in SD-WAN. We have folks saying, oh yeah, in the next year, 40% uh, of our organization is moving to SD-WAN or whatever. They're big numbers. But what we're actually seeing happen out there is we're seeing a lot of folks uh, trialing uh, SD-WAN solutions, and I think that's a good idea. Uh, with all of these different uh, choices out there, you really want to make sure you pick the right one that works for your organization. And if you, you certainly don't want to make a bad bet if you have a thousand branch offices out there. So. You know, start with a maybe a managed service trial or maybe a full uh, full trial, just depending on um, what you're comfortable with. Maybe with one or two branches, probably two is better. And you know, maybe base that trial on you know one or two apps. Maybe not you know going uh, you know, and some of those are not mission critical. I would hope. Some of the other recommendations out there by other uh, vendors is, hey, uh, as your routers start aging out, instead of doing that full network refresh that the traditional vendors have always recommended. You know, consider um, what it would take to replace those um, routers with SD-WAN appliances in stages versus a full rollout. By doing pilots, it really gives you the opportunity to compare the performance of what you're getting currently off your MPLS network with what you should expect when you move to SD-WAN completely. So hopefully, I've given you some ideas of uh, what SD-WAN is, uh, what it provides for you at a very high level, uh, some considerations, some vendor approaches, and that type of thing. Just remember, SD-WAN really provides an alternative or maybe an augmentation to our expensive MPLS connections that we have out there. Some of the drivers for SD-WAN, really the key ones, we want to improve our performance and agility as an organization. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that we have good resiliency of our network, so we uh, lower our downtime. And, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating once you look at these and you can conquer some of those uh, big business issues, then uh, lowering costs uh, sort of comes as a consequence of all that, right? Organizations are saving um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars by offloading a lot of their traffic to 
uh, these internet-based connections versus upgrading their MPLS circuits. So uh, it's certainly worth uh, exploring. Uh, there's, I think, some, uh, some due diligence that needs to be taken, though, uh, just to consider your applications and how you're going to secure those and how you want that traffic to flow. Uh, your service provider or your SD-WAN provider is going to be a key partner of yours going forward. That brings me to the end of this discussion. Hopefully that was valuable to you for any additional information about Sunset Learning or our educational office offers, please uh, visit us at our website or call our main number.